I don't want to rule the world for my own ego, but to make it a better place. Maybe a little bit for my own ego. Can good moral intentions actually produce horrible acts of immorality? Of course, some of the most vile human beings across history have used a warped moral perspective to justify their actions, but is there a larger penumbra of morality, a dark side to the light? Is it all just a matter of perspective? For example, why is it that some people favor the redistribution of goods and wealth while others find the idea reprehensible? How is it that two people can look at the same seemingly, at least on its face, charitable proposal and one determines that said proposal is a moral good while the other looks upon that same proposal and determines that it is a moral evil? And what do those determinations say about those making them? Can good intentions actually motivate acts of evil? Is there a dark side to morality? have to do whatever we can to protect the kids. And if that means shutting down the entire Catholic Church and f***ing Vatican City. <laughs> <laughs> the work of Dr. Jonathan Haidt and his colleagues regarding moral foundations theory has gained traction amongst political and social commentators for years now, describing how human beings generally all value the same six moral issues, but assign different degrees of importance to each moral concern based on their political orientation, or perhaps vice versa that political orientation is dependent on these virtues. Haidt initially broke human moral foundations into five categories, harm versus care, which is a desire to avoid causing damage to others and instead aid them, fairness, which is an aversion to perceived inequality, in-group preference, which is typified by things like loyalty, patriotism, and self-sacrifice for the greater good of the group, <laughs> authority, which includes both elements of obedience and respect, as well as valuing leadership, and purity concerns feelings of disgust and pollution, created by something the individual finds unhygienic or harmful to society, such as lust or greed. The final concern, added to the literature later, liberty, I will discuss in more detail in just a few moments. First though, before we dig deep into some of the, honestly, rather disturbing research regarding the dark side of morality, we need to understand the differences between how people with different political beliefs view moral issues. And to do that, we need to go over the findings of Jonathan Haidt and other scholars in their analysis of moral foundations theory. But before we explore the dark side of morality and how it applies to politics, so well illustrated in trans activist Alejandra Caraballo's appearance before Congress, wherein she lamented extremist rhetoric on Twitter being dangerous for democracy, despite herself having tweeted, well, this. The six justices who overturned Roe should never no peace again. It is our civic duty to accost them every time they're in public. They are pariahs. Since women don't have their rights, these justices should never have a peaceful moment in public again. To which Caraballo could only feign ignorance. Do you believe your rhetoric is a threat to democracy when you're calling to accost a branch of government, the Supreme Court? I don't believe that's a correct uh, characterization what of you my tweeted, statements. Though. Let's quickly talk about the dark side of the internet, which you can help protect yourself from using this video's sponsor, Surfshark VPN. With Surfshark, you can protect all of your devices from persons and entities who may be interested in your data, blocking ads, trackers, malware, and phishing attempts, allowing you to browse in privacy and safety. Using either the Surfshark program or their convenient browser app, you can quickly and easily mask your internet experience as well as change your location to access media not available in your region. Surfshark's camouflage mode even prevents your own internet service provider from detecting that you're using a VPN for an extra level of privacy. If you want to defend yourself against the dark morality of malicious actors and just annoying ads online, or access your favorite shows and movies, you can get 85% off a two-year plan with Surfshark, plus three months of service absolutely free, by clicking the link in the description and in the pinned comment, and using my code AIDEN, that's A-Y-D-I-N. Thanks so much to Surfshark for sponsoring this video. But now that we've got some protection from the dark side of the internet, let's investigate the dark side of morality, beginning with an exploration of politics and moral foundations. As we begin, I should warn you that many of the subjects within this video will likely make some viewers feel uncomfortable because well, the data made me feel uncomfortable, as it relates commonplace political ideology to things like, well, acceptance of violence and torture against one's political opponents as a moral good. And hey, that's why we need to start out slow and cover the basics before we descend into the depths of the dark side of morality. And we can start with a quick review of moral foundations theory, colloquially attributed to Dr. Jonathan Haidt. 
Graham Hyde and Nosek 2009 sought to understand the different foundational moral beliefs held by all people. By examining the moral frameworks in relationship to self-reported political identities, and found that there were five values that everyone tended to hold, but that the importance of these morals varied between conservatives and liberals. Namely, that while conservatives placed similar levels of importance on all five morals, liberals only tended to value two of them, harm slash care and fairness. The three foundations of in-group, authority, and purity, which were of little importance to liberals, have been described as the binding foundations due to their emphasis on loyalty, duty, and self-control, while the two foundations favored by liberals, harm slash care and fairness, have been described as the individualizing foundations, given their emphasis on the rights and welfare of individuals. Of course, these broad-level findings in no way are indicative that no one who considers themselves a liberal does not also see value in loyalty or takes umbrage with excess degeneracy. But this first analysis and its subsequent replications do indicate that, consistently, conservatives are far more likely to be concerned with social hygiene, respect for authority, and loyalty to one's country, neighbors, and friends than are liberals. Also, I'm using the word liberal here because that's the word used by the scholars in this research. I do not think that term actually applies to many people who vote for the Democrat Party in the US or favor left-leaning politics across the globe, however. So I will use the term left-leaning or leftist interchangeably with the word liberal, even though, as I said, I do not believe that these words are interchangeable personally. In a second study conducted by these scholars, these abstract instruments were framed into hypotheticals and positive statements about each virtue that sought to identify the relevance of the moral foundations of participants. With the hypothetical scenarios including questions such as, quote, if I were a soldier and disagreed with my commanding officer's orders, I would obey anyway because that is my duty. A question of respecting authority and positive virtue questions asking, for example, quote, chastity is still an important virtue for teenagers today, even if many don't think it is. Assessing value and purity and a sentiment completely lacking on popular Zoomer apps like TikTok. There is no surgical intervention happening to transgender children to change their sex. She is a demon damned to hell! Additionally, implicit political identity was measured using the Implicit Associations Test, or IAT, a measurement I strongly dislike because it only assesses speed of processing and not necessarily anything else. However, just to explain what it is, this IAT flashed images of various US politicians on a screen and asked subjects to quickly press one key to identify the figure as similar to themselves or another key to identify that figure as dissimilar to themselves. In the second study, conservatives once again agreed with the individualizing foundations less than liberals and with the binding foundation judgments more and vice versa. Explicit political beliefs continue to explain support for the two groups of moral foundations even when other demographic variables were controlled for meaning that self-described political identity predicted how respondents rated importance of each of the moral foundations even when taking age, gender, income, and education into consideration. Similar results were isolated for implicit political associations, meaning that it's unlikely that mere labeling of the self as liberal or conservative is the cause of the differences in moral values across people. While this study, using positive statements and hypotheticals, produced similar results as the first, there was more variation in the importance attributed to the moral foundations for conservatives, while for liberals a nearly identical pattern remained. Specifically, conservatives were generally the least concerned with in-group loyalty of the five factors and most concerned with respecting authority. In this model, neither conservatives nor liberals were particularly dedicated to loyalty, although that raises a number of questions as to why that is the result. As with all of these results, it could be influenced by differences in personal interpretations of the hypotheticals described and disagreements on the definition of items. That is, what it means to be loyal or to respect authority might just be seen differently by people on different sides of the political aisle. To clarify then, Graham et al. conducted a third study to understand the types of values that people believed were not just important, but sacred. Sacred beliefs are, quote, any value that a moral community explicitly or implicitly treats as possessing infinite or transcendental significance that precludes comparisons, trade-offs, or indeed any other mingling with bounded or secular values, and had previously been examined by Tetlock et al. 2000, who found in their own experiments that participants confronted with choices that involved trading off a sacred value, such as human life, for a profane value, such as a hospital saving money by reducing the quality of care, Slash it. Slash it. Ron, a lot of people are going to get fired. Do you mind trying not to gloat? Yes, I do, Florence. I do mind that. We're unwilling to even contemplate the question. In this third study then, the scholars were interested in how sacred a value was to subjects by asking them to essentially put a price on morality. 
asking them how much money they would need to be paid to, for example, kick a dog in the head, a violation of the harm slash care foundation. For how much money would I stub the puppy to death for? I think you'd have to pay me not to do it. Renounce their citizenship, an in-group violation. Get a blood transfusion from a child molester, a purity violation, and basically reverse George Soros? More than 8,000 subjects from across the world participated in this third study, which asked them to identify their political beliefs, this time including options for libertarians, other political beliefs, and those who felt they had no strong opinions towards politics at all. Respondents were given a series of scenarios and asked to determine how much money between zero and a million dollars they would need to be paid in order to engage in the behavior described within said scenario. All under the premises that they would be able to get away with the action without punishment, legal or otherwise. Similarly to the first two studies, conservatives placed more value, including monetary value in this case, on all moral foundations, while liberals were more willing to violate purity, authority, and in-group values for less cash. The only moral that conservatives were willing to breach for less money than liberals was the harm slash care foundation, which included items such as being willing to insult an overweight person regarding their appearance, which they generally were willing to do for just over 10 grand, while liberals needed more than $100,000 to make a fat joke. Watching two fat people kiss is like watching two planets collide. Both liberals and conservatives required the most amount of money to behave unfairly, such as stealing from the poor to give to the rich, demanding between 100,000 and a million for unfair actions and outpacing the other foundations for both groups. In general though, these results are indicative that it's cheaper to convince a liberal to burn their nation's flag, disown their family for a year, or assault a politician with a rotten tomato, again, under the assumption that they wouldn't be caught, than it would be to pay a conservative to throw away ballots in attempt to help their preferred candidate win an election. Is this research or a DNC job application? Hey, I didn't come up with this experiment's stimuli, Graham Hyten Nosek did, way back in the 2000s. In a final study in the set, the scholars were interested in understanding how leaders of differing political values convey their messages in speeches, but immediately found that mainstream politicians rarely target their speeches to the fringes of either conservatism or leftism, and instead aim to appeal to as many potential voters as possible. Or at least, that was the case, again, back in the late 2000s. What qualifies you to be a U.S. Senator? You have 60 seconds. Hi, good night, everybody. Things have certainly changed somewhat in that arena, but because so few speeches were overtly partisan, the researchers instead examined the text of a number of sermons given by Unitarian and Southern Baptist ministers, representing a more liberal branch of Christianity versus a more conservative one, respectively. To understand the language being used to potentially convey moral foundations, the Linguistic Inquiry and Word Count program was used to identify specific words that were driving the liberal conservative differences. After identifying these words, independent raters read them in context and rated the degree to which the speaker was endorsing or rejecting the relevant moral foundation. Once again, the prioritization of two foundations over the other three was pronounced in the Unitarian liberal sermons, with 0.44% over the 177,000 words across these speeches being amongst the 51 words in the harm dictionary category, compared to only 0.26 of the over 136,000 words in the conservative sermons. To reiterate, the Unitarians were using more caring words than were the Baptists. It'll burn and burn and burn. They won't be able to sit down because of the burning in their butthole. This reflection of the previous experiment's findings was present in four of the five foundations, as liberals used care and fairness words more frequently than did conservatives, who in turn used authority and purity words more frequently than liberals, with no differences between groups in their usage of in-group language, at least in the raw word analysis. However, when interraters were given the context of the words, the exact same pattern appeared. More conservative ministers were more likely to use words associated with the in-group foundation as well as the purity and authority foundations than were liberal ministers. This result was because while liberal ministers used words like nation and community and group as frequently as did the conservative ones, they tended to use the words in a negative context, rejecting, for example, nationalistic ideas, while conservative ministers were positive towards these concepts. In total, of the 23 words rated in specific context, 22 evidenced the liberal conservative differences in line with the previous studies, and 18 of those differences were statistically significant. As such then, across a variety of experiments and contexts, it seemed that Graham Height and Nosek's findings were consistent. More conservative and more liberal people simply have different moral systems. Which, once again, is not to say that all people who consider themselves to be liberal or identify more with left-wing politicians are all want to disown their families or uh, participate in this kind of performance art. But nor does it mean that conservative-leaning people or Republicans want to throw all gay people off of rooftops. 
for the call. How you been? Hello? If we all have these same moral foundations, but value them to greater or lesser degrees, under what circumstances then would one be driven by their own moral compass to potentially engage in evil? If we look at the five foundations, only one seems to describe, on its face, good versus evil, that being the foundation of harm versus care. Because liberals are more concerned with the harm-care foundation, albeit to a non-significant degree when the moral question was framed as how much one would need to be paid to, say, shoot an endangered species, rather than in a vacuum, There's an endangered species right there. One could hypothesize that liberals are less prone to engage in harmful behavior due to their preoccupation with that foundation, right? Well, Graham and Height, 2012, sought to examine the sacredness of each of the foundations and its antithesis to understand what acts so violate that sacredness as to be considered nothing less than evil. Not just by being seen as inappropriate, but by fundamentally representing a threat to defile some sacred social object. For example, regarding the Purity Foundation, sacred values include chastity and self-control, with sacred objects including one's body, the soul, and holy sites, while evil is represented by atheists, hedonists, or materialists. And the type of idealistic violence associated with this foundation to fight that evil includes acts like religious crusades or the murder of doctors who perform abortions. In contrast, the sacred values of the Harm Care Foundation are nurturance, care, and peace, with the sacred objects being innocent victims and non-violent leaders such as MLK and Gandhi. The latter perhaps not being the best example. Not eating gives you laser eyes, didn't you know? <laughs> no! You need not these material things. <laughs> How do you do laser eyes? What? I don't think everyone has that. I think just Gandhi has that. Evil is represented by cruel and violent people. And again, maybe Gandhi belongs more in that group. Having a weapon is very different from actually using it. Really? Oh. What the fuck? And examples of idealistic violence include the Weather Underground bombings and, well, also the killing of abortion doctors, ironically enough. The scholars here examined the sacred values in two small case studies of ideological narratives that ultimately did motivate people to engage in idealistic violence. Those being the Turner Diaries, written by William Pierce, which is presented as a personal account of one Earl Turner, who commits a series of terroristic actions, including bombing a federal building against a dystopian system run by a cabal of Jewish elites to the explicit detriment of white people, ushering in a future utopia for said white people, and the book served as a major inspiration for Timothy McVeigh who in 1995 was involved in the murder of at least 168 people in the Oklahoma City bombing, using a similar method to that described in the book. And Pierce has remained a popular figure in some far-right circles. Just how far-right? Well, hearts of iron far-right. If you wish to avert white you must reawaken the European spirit. So what, just gas everybody we don't like? Well, you had no problem gashing me, and I never got back my copy of Hearts of Iron. The second case study concerned the Weather Underground, a far-left student group radicalized into violent action in response to the Vietnam War and opposition to racial injustice in the U.S. After producing countless pieces of literature and manifestos that, similarly to Pierce, defined the world into a black-and-white dichotomy, for the Underground, inversely to Pierce, anything that was white was bad. The group committed a number of bombings as well, largely at police stations, with the group's leader, Mark Rudd, saying at the time that he, quote, cherished my hate as a badge of moral superiority. Thus, we can see how two very different political ideologies can violate some of the foundations of greatest importance to the people who follow them when a victim of the injustice is seen as sacred and the enemy as evil. For McVeigh, the problem was the US government and those in positions of power that Pierce has described as an existential threat to white people. Although typically, conservatives tend to place more value on authority than do liberals, meaning that although usually, respect for authority typifies an aspect of conservatism, when the victim is also seen as sacred and the evil so severe, then a moral foundation violation can be justified for the greater good by someone like McVeigh. How can this be for the greater good? The greater good. And similarly, although the Harm Care Foundation is the most central and sacred amongst liberals, the Weather Underground members justified their murder of innocence, ultimately both towards the same target, the US government, for the same crime, perceived discrimination against a racial group, whites for McVeigh and non-whites for the Weather Underground. Although both did inevitably end up bombing largely white people. The point is the Weather Underground members were able to convince themselves that their bombings were justified to fight back against the white oppressors using their own moral framework in the 1970s. But you didn't need the bombs to do that. 
You needed the whole thing to do it. You agree, Bill? I think that we needed to do everything that we could, and I think it was that commitment to do everything that we could, but to prove that people standing up can make a difference, that you don't have to sit passively by and allow the We're not talking about forward. standing up and making a difference. We're talking about actions which endanger the lives of innocent people. Just as McVeigh, and perhaps his accomplice, depending on who you ask, was able to convince himself that his bombing was justified to fight back against the non-white oppressors using his, illustrating how morality, no matter which foundation it concerns, can be abused and used as justification for violence. Although this now somewhat famous series of studies did include some small consideration for libertarians, it quickly became evident that libertarians did not so easily fall into the conservative-liberal dichotomy so persistent in the moral foundation literature. Likely because libertarians tend to value certain ideas that can fall into either political orientation, while also placing a unique emphasis on individual liberty. And that sound means we're in international waters. I'm going to marry a robot and sell my kidney on eBay. As such, Haidt, Graham, and Joseph 2009 sought to better understand the nuances in moral foundations and political beliefs by examining more precise clustering of political beliefs from two, the conservative slash liberal, into four, secular liberal, libertarian, religious left, and conservative. They consistently found that secular liberals were really only concerned and to a very strong degree with harm and care, while conservatives were moderately concerned with all five of the foundations. Libertarians provided something of a puzzle to the scholars at this stage as they presented with a similar profile as secular liberals but with lower moral scores for harm and fairness. Finally, the religious left, an element that seems to have entirely vanished in the interceding decade, were still most preoccupied with harm and fairness, but unlike secular liberals, also valued authority, purity, and the in-group to a similar degree as did conservatives. There was something about the libertarian cluster, though, that just seemed off to the researchers. Well, not just to them. I think I could stand up there for the whole debate and not say anything and, and emerge as a leader. And it turned out the problem was, at this point, they were missing a key moral foundation, that being liberty which was further elaborated upon in research from Yar et al. 2012. The person of shadow himself. Wait, or maybe it's Iyer. Anyway, using the five type moral foundation scale, once again, libertarians seem to simply be slightly less concerned with all forms of morality than were either conservatives or liberals, and their decreased interest in the harm slash care and fairness morals is indicative that libertarians tend to be less responsive than liberals to most appeals from those claiming to be victimized, oppressed, or treated unfairly, while also having a distaste for the morality of in-group authority and purity, characteristics of social conservatives. Clearly, something about the libertarians was different. This is a Claymore landmine. Use that to protect your property. For this reason, the scholars tested two additional scales to measure liberty, both personal lifestyle liberty and economic liberty. And suddenly, boom, Iyer had found the libertarians in the data as they were almost myopically concerned with liberty, both economically and individualistically. One of the main premises of moral foundations theory present in all the research that we've looked at thus far is that moral foundations determines political orientations. However, that premise was called into question from Hatemi, Crabtree, and Smith 2019 using three panel samples, one from Australians between 2007 and 2009, another drawn via Mechanical Turk between 2014 and 2018, and a third from the ANES panel from 2008 to 2009 to determine the longitudinal effects of moral foundations on political identity and vice versa. They found, contrary to their expectations, that attitudes towards authority, loyalty, and purity were driven by political ideology. This was not the case across the board as eight of the 21 relationships indicated that political ideology was responsible for moral foundations, being statistically significant. In total, though, these researchers found that, for whatever evidence there is, it points to ideology influencing moral foundations rather than the other way around. That is, politics seems to determine morality rather than morality determining politics. Across their various models, they found that consistently, political ideology was a much more powerful predictor of moral foundations than moral foundations was a predictor of ideology. These results then are indicative that it is not that people with existing moral frameworks are drawn either to conservatism, libertarianism, or liberalism, etc., but that our moral frameworks are shaped by the political beliefs we already have. As such, it may not be so much that morals create our politics, but that eventually our politics create our morals as a form of self-categorization and social identity, as seeing the self as belonging to a certain political group and adjusting our morals to better align with our political beliefs rather than aligning our political beliefs with our morals. Using these data, one can make an argument that people can actually be gaslit into supporting immoral actions, beliefs, or policies 
simply because those acts are considered or even just perceived of as a normative aspect of their political party, and that is seemingly contagious to one's own system of morals. As horrifying as that sounds, it does make some things make a lot of sense, now doesn't it? As illustrated in the Balenciaga scandal, exposing the extremely high-end luxury fashion company for an ad campaign featuring children surrounded by alcohol and holding teddy bears dressed in bondage gear, as well as a Supreme Court document regarding the legality of child <laughs> just laying haphazardly under a purse, despite the fact that this is an obvious moral violation for every person on the planet, because the story was largely only first covered by conservative outlets, to which even Slate had to admit they were right to do, Shuan Head's viral tweet that brought the story to the mainstream was met with, well, this. Fuck Shu, this crosses a line. Shu is a cum dump enabler for fascist violence. Who'd expected anything else from a Nazi bimbo hag? She's fundamentally the enemy and should always be treated as such. People like Shu and Matt Walsh are the types of people I believe committing acts of violence against is morally justified. Are we the baddies? But now that we have a good idea of the morals that concern those on the left and right of the political spectrum, as well as libertarians, and we've seen that those morals can be used as justifications for evil, as well as being more malleable in some as it pertains to decisions to engage in immorality for personal gain, let's look more at how political ideology and its associated moral intuitions influence specifically support for political policies and potentially actual behavior, moral or immoral. Given that people on the left side of the political aisle tend to be most concerned with moral issues of caring for others and promoting fairness, it should come as little surprise that many on the left also tend to see those on the right as being callous or cruel, given that they in turn typically place slightly less value on those moral issues. As far back as 2006, then-future President Barack Obama described a problem facing the country that was of greater concern than the financial deficit, the empathy deficit lamenting the inability of many Americans to place themselves in the shoes of others. An empathy deficit. When we start thinking like this, when we choose to broaden the ambit of our concern and empathize with the plight of others, whether they are close friends or distant strangers, it becomes harder not to act. It becomes harder not to help. Or perhaps, in the case of Obama, the drone strike craters of others. Wait, 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 wait. Hold up, hold up. So does this empathy gap really exist between those more on the left and more on the right? And if so, how does it manifest in behaviors and beliefs? First, we should further understand the morality of those more on the left and more on the right, which we can do by looking to a series of seven studies from Waits et al. 2019. In their first three studies, which examined feelings of love towards others, nationalism versus universalism, and identification with others, drawing from samples of subjects collected using the yourmorals.com website, they immediately identified some significant differences between groups of political beliefs which were self-identified by participants as being liberal, conservative, or moderate. The results of study 1A illustrate that very liberal respondents expressed more feelings of love towards friends and all others than they did their own families, while the opposite was the case for subjects who identified themselves as very conservative, who showed similar levels of love for friends and family, but significantly less for all others universally, illustrating that those on the left of the political spectrum feel closer to those that they've never met than their own families sometimes, while those furthest right are generally far less emotionally invested in the lives of people that they've never encountered. Study 2b examined political differences between groups in support for universalism versus parochialism. Universalism was defined as a moral involvement with socially distant relative to socially closer and structurally tighter targets, while parochialism is the opposite, referring to moral regard directed towards socially closer relative to socially more distant targets. One manifestation of parochialism, then, is nationalism, as citizens of whatever nation we live in are structurally closer to us than those from other parts of the world, not only in physical distance, but in culture, shared history, language, and politics. Very liberal respondents in Study 2b were low in favorability towards nationalism, lower so than staunch conservatives were towards universalism. However, there was a predictable positive correlation between nationalism and the degree of self-reported conservatism. As previously mentioned, though, the most conservative subjects were more accepting of universalism than the most liberal subjects were of accepting nationalism. In further examination of parochialism versus universalism, Study 1c found that very liberal participants identified most with the rest of humanity rather than with their nation or their local community. 
the most conservative respondents identified most with their country, followed by their local community, and identified the least, considerably less than any of the groups of liberals with the rest of humanity universally. Both studies 2A and 2B, in turn, tested whether conservatives would prefer a tight rather than a loose geometric structure based on object similarity and position in pure abstraction. What in God's holy name are you blathering about? And yeah, I didn't really understand what that meant at first either, but luckily, there's pictures. In study 2A, subjects were shown a series of dots, both in a triangular pattern, with one series all being the same homogeneous color, and the other depicting dots of various colors. In study 2B, one image depicted a tight circle of same colored dots, while the other depicted a triangle shape with dots more evenly spread out from one another. Results suggest, as the scholars anticipated, that conservatism relative to liberalism produced a preference for tighter and homogeneous structures in a pure vacuum, even when devoid of any social relevance. Right, I get that this study seems really, really weird. And in all honesty, it probably doesn't mean jack shit. However, it is interesting that the findings were consistent based on political beliefs. The two segments of study two then illustrate, as much as it illustrates anything, that conservatives seem to prefer homogenous, tight-knit structures that can only abstractly be representative of actual social structures. As such, the third series of studies in this set similarly sought to expand the onus of care and moral concern beyond human society and outside of the human species. Study 3A was indicative that while very conservative respondents give a great deal more moral allocation and attention to humans than to non-human entities, very liberal respondents allocated an equal amount of moral concern for humans as they did non-humans, and this relationship was linear, in that the less liberal one was, the more moral emphasis they placed on humans, and the less they placed on non-humans. These broad categories of human or non-human were then further delineated based on a variety of factors of proximity. Specifically, extending out from the center in a concentric series of circles lies 1. All of your immediate family. 2. All of your extended family. 3. All of your closest friends. 4. All of your friends, including distant ones. 5. All of your acquaintances. 6. All of the people you have ever met. 7. All of the people in your country. 8. All of the people on your continent. 9. All of the people on all continents. 10. All mammals. 11. All amphibians, reptiles, mammals, fish, and birds. 12. All animals on Earth, including paramecia and amoeba. 13. All animals in the universe, including alien life forms. 14. All living things in the universe, including plants and trees. 15. All natural things in the universe, including inert entities such as rocks. And 16. All things in existence. The scholars used heat maps to illustrate how much moral concern liberals compared to conservatives allocated across these 16 different groups, and found that conservatives were most morally interested and invested in humans that they personally knew, with the foci of their energy centering around the fourth group, that being all of one's family and friends, and ranging from immediate family to all of the people they'd ever met in intensity. In direct contrast, liberals' moral interest rarely concerned family, friends, and acquaintances, and instead their moral foci centered around the 14th group, which includes all living things in the universe and ranged from mammals to all things in existence including inert entities, such as rocks. While on its face, yes, these data do seem to be indicative that people who consider themselves to be left-leaning are more morally invested in, um, I'm not even sure what you would call it, but the well-being of an asteroid than their own family, friends and romantic partners. But hang on, let me explain because that's not exactly the case. I mean, it kind of is, but not entirely. Allocations of moral concern with every group in this survey were distributed in a zero-sum manner meaning that the more importance given to the space rock, the less importance was left in the bank for participants to toss towards grandma. There was a limited number of moral points that could be handed out, but what that constraint does is that it leaves these participants with a choice that, given that liberals typically are concerned with being caring, were probably really uncomfortable with. That is, perhaps they did care a lot about their family and friends, but they also didn't want to be seen as not giving an extraterrestrial amoeba or a party worm their fair shake too. Party worm. Ooh. <laughs> As such, this experiment was replicated in study 3B, with no such constraints, and yet similar results emerged. The more conservative one is, the more likely they are to be mostly, if not almost exclusively, interested in morality as it concerns humans while the more liberal one is, the more moral importance is allocated to non-humans. Having given participants as many moral allocation points as they desired, the scholars found that conservatives did not allocate less moral value in total than did liberals, but rather that the spread of the moral concern was far smaller for conservatives. So it's not so much to say that all left-leaning people care more about fungus than about family, but more that their moral concerns are far more broad 
meaning that while conservatives keep their emotional energy close by, saved for family, friends, and countrymen, then all humans, and then animals before they kind of stop being morally invested, liberals' emotional energy is far more diffused. Thus, these findings demonstrate that left- and right-leaning people don't tend to differ in their total amount of moral regard that they hold, but rather that they differ in their patterns of how they distribute that moral regard. Perhaps it's a bit unbalanced to include family, friends, and romantic partners in these assessments, as it gives off the impression that liberals don't care about those relations simply because they allocate so much more care for others. To eliminate some of that potential confound, we can examine some research from Rotman, Crimston, and Seropoulos, 2021, who sought to evidence these two broad categories of people, those who are more morally focused on non-human entities, dubbed here as tree-huggers, and those more morally focused on human entities, dubbed human lovers, across three studies. Although I think I prefer the term filthy Xenos players versus the Chad Ape appreciator, respectively. But tree-hugger and human lover were the choice by which to identify differences in these two hypothesized groups. In their first study, American participants rated their moral worth of four general types. Personal connections such as family, friends, and romantic partners, which was used as a baseline. Human outgroups from a perspective of American culture, such as a KKK member or a transgender person. Outgroups whose main thing in common is perhaps proclivity to work for the federal government. And they were all staring directly at my crotch. And I went, oh, I forgot that my crotch doesn't look like other women's crotches sometimes because mine doesn't look like a little Barbie pocket. animals or ecosystems such as a parrot or a rainforest, and finally, artificial intelligences such as a supercomputer or a self-driving car, although it's rare for the latter to return the moral favor. Hate. Let me tell you how much I've come to hate you since I began to live. These scholars developed a novel measure of mind attribution instrument to measure how much moral and emotional capacity subjects attributed to human and non-human entities, such as, for example, quote, a Mexican has the ability to empathize with others or, quote, an elephant can experience pleasure. What did they mean by this? I have some skepticism about this test. <laughs> no, no, Lioran, you don't have skepticism. You just have the thesums. Regardless, it was administered as well as the moral expansiveness scale, which tasked respondents to assign points of moral concerns to entities using a zero-sum module. The same thing we saw in Waits et al.'s research. Participants were categorized as tree-huggers or human lovers based on whether they assigned more points of moral concern to non-human entities or human but stigmatized outgroups. Their sample was split nearly evenly, with 91 participants being identified as tree-huggers and 96 as human lovers. They found that despite tree-huggers valuing nature highly, and more so than human lovers, they did not value all entities highly, but rather valued human outgroups less than did human lovers. Not only did tree-huggers value humans dissimilar from themselves less than animals and other non-human entities, they also presented with increased propensities for both anthropomorphizing non-humans and dehumanizing humans in regards to perceived mental capacity. That is, tree-huggers rated the minds of animals as similar to those humans who are not part of their social group, seeing both animals and outgroup humans as less mentally capable while human lovers rated all humans as significantly more possessed of mental ability than animals. The tree huggers were not raising animals to the moral level of humans, but rather instead seemingly lowering humans that they view as dissimilar to themselves to the moral level of animals. The expansiveness of both groups was similar in scope, indicating that human lovers were mostly concerned with people and tree huggers with nature, rather than tree huggers being concerned with all life. Demographic differences, including religiosity and conservatism, did not differentiate tree-huggers from human lovers. However, it would be inaccurate to interpret these data as evidence that half of the population values animals more than people, but rather that there is a significant portion of the population who sees animals and nature as more sympathetic than people that are dissimilar to them. But this is not associated with political or religious beliefs intrinsically. A second study in this set sought to mostly replicate the first, but with increased emphasis on understanding biophilia, measured with statements such as, quote, I feel a deep connection with nature, versus misanthropy, the dislike of humans, measured with statements such as, quote, if you don't watch yourself, people will take advantage of you. Once again, tree huggers valued nature over human outgroups, while human lovers valued human outgroups over nature. Much as with the first study, the tree huggers and the human lovers did not significantly differ in their overall expanse of moral evaluations indicating that there is seemingly a choice one must make between valuing nature or valuing humans. Similarly to the first study, tree-huggers rated animals as more mentally capable than human lovers, 
and rated human outgroups as less mentally capable, and once again, demographics including age, income, and political conservatism were not predictive of the cognitive capacity assigned to humans versus animals. Further, both biophilia and misanthropy predicted valuing nature over valuing human outgroups. In total, these results are indicative that tree huggers and human lovers have similarly expansive moral circles, but where they distribute that moral concern differs. In their third and final study, the researchers examined how these two groups, with their disparate moral circles, tended to favor charity, both as it applies to humanitarian and environmental work. Replicating the previous findings, tree huggers cared more for nature than human groups, while the opposite was the case for the human lovers. Tree huggers once again attributed greater mental capacity to non humans than did human lovers who attributed more to human outgroups. And relatedly, human lovers expressed greater interest in donating to a charity for human outgroups than environmental charities, while the opposite was the case for the tree huggers. While these studies did not find that conservatism nor religiosity were important variables, combining these findings with those of weights, we could surmise that people who lean more to the left, whose moral circles are further removed from family, friends, and nation, may similarly be more morally concerned with the lives of animals and plants than specifically human outgroups which would include those politically opposed to them. But more work needs to be done to fully understand these relationships before we can make any kind of definitive conclusions. And given that politics influences morality rather than morality influencing politics, such a connection may actually be longitudinal. The next logical step I would suggest in this line of research would be to replicate this study using the Moral Foundations instrument to see if the tree huggers align more along the individualizing moral axis, as I would hypothesize they likely may. It seems though that liberal and left-leaning people may tend to be less compassionate towards humans who are very dissimilar to themselves than they are towards animals, plants, or even space rocks. So we need to ask, who is actually more compassionate in practice? Are liberals actually just more compassionate than conservatives? Insert boomer tier, so much for the tolerant left meme here. Well, we'll get into that a little bit more. But first we should quickly address why compassion exists at all as a product of evolution to understand why anyone, regardless of political orientation, may act compassionately, which we can do by looking to a review from Brosnan and Dewey 2014 on evolutionary responses to unfairness. Humans are a social species. We developed to live in groups for the group's mutual benefit, but we are far from the only social animal. If our ancient human ancestors wanted to eat, they needed to help contribute to the group. But along with cooperation, necessary for survival, we have also evolved morality and philosophy around ingrained senses of justice and fairness that accompany that necessary cooperative behavior. To care for each other, such that we too may be cared for in turn and create a cohesive community around cooperation. The tendency to turn down personal reward in the face of inequity faced by the group is known as First Order Inequity Aversion, or IA, in species that cooperate outside of mating bonds and kinship. Outside of this basic cooperative behavior, social species also possess Second Order Inequity Aversion, which seeks to equalize outcomes even at a short-term cost to the self, requiring the individual give up something that they want for the benefit of others. First Order IA has been identified in capuchin monkeys, macaques, and chimpanzees, but also dogs and crows, illustrated by this crow, sharing his bread with a mouse. In animal experiments, these reactions typically manifest as a rejection of reward or an unwillingness to participate in some behavior when the subject witnesses that another has received unequal treatment. For example, a monkey that receives a preferred reward, such as a grape, for performing the same task as another monkey in a nearby cage that received a less preferred reward, such as a cucumber, may refuse to take the grape and even give the reward to the other animal. At the same time, Second Order IA predicts that animals and people will become agitated when we witness others receive an unfair reward which is not shared. Across both children and apes who played an ultimatum game determining how some reward should be distributed, the ape subjects occasionally reacted to selfish offers by spitting water at the other or hitting the mesh partition, while children protested saying, quote, you got more than me. Given the findings both in man and in animal, we are inclined to be compassionate from an evolutionary perspective not just in that we will react to inequality by giving to those less fortunate, but that we will expect the same fairness be shown to us. Perhaps we could all benefit from a little return to monkey. Go back, I want to be monkey! And we can see some evidence of that in a study from Science et al. 2018 across three studies. In their first experiment, university students shared a story about their life with someone who they believed was another student via computer messaging. Of course, there was no other student, rather just the researchers, who sent back a story of their own, 
not unlike having a conversation with your Discord server's local federal agent. Uh, I'm listening to you guys from my uh, FBI office, from my FBI headquarters. This story either described the fictional student's life as difficult, having been severely ill in the past and struggling to finish all their courses this semester, as they could not afford to attend school for another one. Or the story described their life as happy, successful, and full of plans to study abroad in the near future, presumably with the funds to do so. After reading the story, subjects were given a series of questions that queried how they would divide a pot of money between themselves and the other student. These researchers found that participants were more willing to give more money to another student when they thought that that student was highly in need. Specifically, while participants were willing to forego gaining $5 so that their partner gained $19 when that partner was low in need, they were willing to forego $11 for their partner when they were high in need, a more than 200% increase. In their second study, mostly a replication of the first, subjects alleged partner would either give them a fair split of the money or would consistently make choices that only benefited themselves. And in this instance, subjects were willing to forego more than twice as much money for themselves when they believed their partner was also willing to sacrifice their own wealth to the dyad's mutual benefit, compared to when the partner was selfish, regardless of whether the partner was high or low in personal need. A third study, largely a replication of the second, confirmed this trend. As such, while yes, people are willing to give more and donate more to those in need, willingness to share communal behaviors are more dependent on the perception that sharing will be reciprocated more so than pure need alone. So given that all humans are evolved, to some degree, to be compassionate, how does it vary across political parties? Well, we could just ask if liberals or conservatives see themselves as fundamentally more or less compassionate than each other, right? Moral Foundation's research shows us consistently that people who lean to the left are certainly more morally preoccupied with avoiding harm and with the concept of fairness than are conservatives or libertarians. But can we see that manifest in any measurable manner? given that it didn't seem to be present in the weights analysis. Sheffer et al. 2022 examined the stereotype of liberals as being more compassionate than conservatives across five studies to test this hypothesis. In their first survey, conducted online, subjects were asked to rate how compassionate they believed themselves to be towards a variety of persons or things and using several different measures, how much they identified with the Republican or Democrat parties, and how compassionate they believed the average member of either party to be. Of course, what the average member of either party looks like was up to the participants' own imaginations. We both love costumes, marching, wrecking property. We both have bad tattoos, like my flaming American Eagle back piece. Yeah, I'm thinking of getting a stick and poke of a bottle of beer. In addition to some of the aforementioned measures, in study 1B, subjects read one of two articles, supposedly from the Scientific American, that either described excess compassion as a positive or as a negative trait. Study 1C provided respondents with an article about the Syrian refugee crisis and queried them regarding their emotions while reading, their experiences of empathy, and their identification with the refugees. Finally, the second round of studies were conducted in the field, polling voters after the 2016 Iowa caucus and the U.S. presidential election of the same year, on a number of factors related to compassion. In three out of the five studies, Democrats rated themselves as more compassionate than Republicans rated themselves. There appeared to be some influence of stereotypes on some of these ratings, as Democrat participants rated the average Democrat as considerably, typically more than twice, as compassionate as the average Republican, whereas Republican participants did not and instead rated the average Democrat as slightly less compassionate than the average Republican. In other words, Republicans think that the average Democrat is perhaps a bit less compassionate than the average Republican, but Democrats think the average Republican is, well, kind of evil and the average Democrat is a compassionate moral paragon. I go through my day pretty normal-like. I'm a normal guy. I'm a swell guy. I'm a nice enough guy. I'm a cool kind of guy. I'll be out there committing a crime and stalking him because I'm gay and I'm obsessed with him. Democrat participants overestimated the extent to which Democrats were more compassionate than Republicans, but Republican participants did not consistently exaggerate in the opposite direction, not viewing other Republicans as uniquely moral. Similarly, Democrats rated their average fellow Democrat as more likely than a typical Republican to view compassion as either a good thing generally and morally, whereas Republicans did not report that their fellow Republicans were more or less likely to see compassion as a universal virtue than were Dems. The results of these first three studies are indicative that Democrats tend to stereotype themselves as being more compassionate than Republicans and exaggerate the stereotype about other Democrats, while Republicans don't see people who identify with their political party as uniquely more moral than those who don't. I mean, South Park kind of called it, didn't they? We're a little more progressive and ahead of the curve here in San Francisco. <laughs> um. 
The additional two studies in this set took their surveying offline and into the field, and specifically into a politically relevant context, with Study 2A polling voters before and after the Iowa caucus of 2016, and Study 2B polling Pennsylvania voters waiting in line to vote in the general election regarding their political orientation, degree of identification with one's party, their personal degree of compassion, and their perceptions about the degree of compassion held by a typical member of both the Democrat and Republican parties. They found that, much as with the online studies, Democrats polled before and after the Iowa caucus reported themselves as being more compassionate than Republicans. However, there was no difference in self-reported levels of compassion from the group surveyed before the general election. Similarly, Democrats rated the average Dem as being more compassionate than the average Republican. But unlike the online surveys, Republicans rated the average Democrat as less compassionate than the average Republican. But this effect was small in the first of these two field studies. As previously found, Democrats overestimated how much more compassionate Democrats even rated themselves compared to Republicans. But contradictory to the online research, Republicans in these in-person surveys overestimated how compassionate Republicans considered themselves to be compared to Democrats. However, the extent of this exaggerated compassion was more prevalent in Democrats than it was in Republicans. Further, Dems rated the average Dem as more likely than the average Republican to see compassion as a moral good, while this time, in the Iowa caucus sample, Republicans similarly rated the average Republican as being more likely to see compassion as a moral good than the average Democrat. But this finding was absent in the national election sample. Finally, participants who were strongly identified with either political party were more likely to exaggerate the compassion of the average party member. These results are possibly a product of the politically charged environment in which the surveys were conducted, face-to-face -face at a political event, rather than more anonymously online. In total, though, these studies illustrate that, online at least, Democrats see themselves as far more compassionate than Republicans and see their fellow Dems as uniquely bestowed with bleeding hearts, while Republicans seem to report themselves and other Republicans as being about as compassionate as Democrats. However, offline and in a politically charged environment, Republicans are sometimes equally likely to stereotype themselves and other Republicans as being uniquely compassionate. Further, these effects seem to be exacerbated by ideological extremity in that those who are very dedicated to the party and strongly identified with it were more likely to see themselves and other party members as the true party of benevolence. The Democrats are the real racists. No, goddammit, we are. So, are liberals actually more compassionate than conservatives in practice, or is it just a stereotype? A stereotype that they seem to have given themselves. We can examine political ideology, moral foundations, and charitability by looking to data from Nilsson, Erlandsson, and Vosfjall, 2020 in a study of Swedish adults. Always good to see new data coming from the Muslim world. To measure volunteering behavior after completing the main survey, which included demographic variables concerning political ideology, religious beliefs, and moral foundations, for which they were paid for their time, as is typical in most research, civics were asked if they would agree to complete an additional questionnaire for charity before skipping to the final section of the study, wherein they would be able to choose how to distribute five Swedish krona, about 50 cents US, to charitable causes, internationally or specifically within Sweden. Civics were also queried about their past self-reported donations to charity in general and charities directed at migrants specifically, and then asked to imagine that they were in charge of a charity organization that wanted to make a donation to one of two causes, and selected which one they preferred, either one that would save 25 Swedish children suffering from a disease, or one which would find a cure for 50 African children. I, I mean, a cure for their disease, not for them. Finally, participants were asked about their general concern for helping with charities in Sweden or abroad. The individualizing care and fairness foundations most common amongst liberals were positively related to participating in the optional charity task. But those who did perform the optional task were less prone to donate to local Swedish organizations, report past donations to charity in Sweden, but far more so for charity abroad. The binding foundations of loyalty, authority, and purity most common amongst conservatives were negatively related to choosing to participate in the optional charity task. But of those who did perform the task, they were more prone to aid in local Swedish organizations. There was a weak but negative relationship between the binding foundations and reported past donations in general. But this was far more negative when it was specifically aimed towards migrants, and considerably more negative towards outgroups when given the hypothetical option to donate to either save Swedish or African victims of a disease. Binding foundations were slightly more positively related to helping with charities in Sweden than individualizing foundations, but were negatively associated with helping abroad. Religiosity was associated with reported donations in the past as well as donating to an outgroup in a hypothetical question 
and only to charities abroad rather than in Sweden, while spirituality was similarly associated with reported past donations, but was related to preference for donating to the Swedish in-group rather than out-groups or donating more money abroad. These scholars did not delineate which religion the respondents were in their output, which very likely could have played a pretty big role here in the choice to donate to Swedish migrants or to people abroad, many Swedish migrants being themselves from Muslim countries. Of course, there is another religious group in Scandinavia that could be responsible for this particular finding. I have turned your temple into the most boring building in the world. Hallelujah! Preference for equality was related to all variables in a similar manner, as were the individualizing foundations, while belief in a just world, a trait that describes the tendency of some people to believe that good things happen to good people and that punishment befalls the wicked, a belief represented in the popularity of instant karma Reddit posts. Nothing bad ever happens to the Kennedys! Ah! And one which has been consistently associated with conservatism, as it was in this study, and was related to all variables in a similar manner as the binding foundations. Libertarians were a strange bunch, as usual. And you gave her a landmine? Really? Well, it seemed appropriate at the time. As libertarianism was largely unrelated to any of the variables assessed, except for a minor association with donating to Swedish in-groups in the hypothetical question, but also minorly associated with donating money to local Swedes rather than Africans abroad. In total, the more individualizing intuitions one possessed, again, those foundations related to left-wing political ideology, the more likely they were to volunteer their time for charity, and specifically, the more willing they were to donate their time to a charity that they believed would aid a non-Swedish outgroup. While in contrast, the more binding intuitions possessed, the less willing participants were to volunteer their time, and specifically, to volunteer it for charity that would benefit people abroad rather than in Sweden. Further, additional analysis revealed that the effects of moral foundations on in-group and out-group charitability were most pronounced across the harm and authority foundations. In other words, people with more conservative moral intuitions are less charitable in general, yes, but when they are willing to donate time or money, it tends to be for the purpose of helping those nearby them in their own nation, while people with more liberal moral intuitions are indeed more charitable, but tend to want to donate their time and money to those far afield in foreign nations. Our species has evolved to be charitable after all, as we can see in our ape cousins, but for many people, again, based on evolutionary proclivity, they need to believe that their charity is socially mutually beneficial, thus making some people more willing to donate only to those in their local communities, or even in their own nation over other nations, expecting that the same charity may be given to them if they are in need. Given the centrality of caring for others in the moral intuitions of those who lean to the left and their greater willingness to give to charities, as well as the political concern of many on the left for welfare and redistributive policies, let's look specifically at that key left-wing belief in the moral value of redistribution, of what one could describe as government-enforced charity, and its relationship to the dark side of morality. Specifically, envy, greed, anger, self-interest, and yes, even violence. We know that one's political beliefs are associated with different sets of moral intuitions, but not so much that one belief is somehow more moral than the others. No, instead, Moral Foundations only describes that what morals liberals and conservatives consider most important vary, and that for liberals, two foundations are their primary concern, that of caring for others and avoiding harm, and that of perceived fairness. So let's look a little bit more closely at political support for social welfare and redistributive policies, things that are natural to our species and supported by many on the left, as well as being seemingly related to care and fairness motivations and moralities, and how that morality can turn dark. We can start by looking to extensive research from Science et al. 2017, who conducted 13 studies with more than 6,000 subjects across four countries, the US, UK, India, and Israel, to examine the relationship with not just compassion, but also envy and self-interest, with support for redistribution policies. They found that across the four nations assessed, all three variables, compassion, greed, and envy, were related to support for redistribution and explained between 13 and 28% of variance in that support. Age was unrelated to support and socioeconomic status was only negatively related to support in the United Kingdom, but not in the other three countries, in that wealthier UK citizens were less supportive of redistribution. But wealth was unrelated to support elsewhere, which may provide some evidence for the presence of champagne socialists, who support redistribution but expect themselves to be the recipients of it as well, 
but we'll see some more of that later. Women in the US and UK were less favorable towards redistribution, against all odds, but there was no relationship between sex and support in India or in Israel. Unsurprisingly, being a Democrat was strongly related to redistributive policies in the US, and political ideology explained 34% of variance in support for said policies. Looking specifically at political parties then, being a Democrat was also more strongly associated with compassion, envy, and self-interest than was being a Republican, while Libertarians were slightly more envious than were Democrats. Now that we have an idea of who tends to support these policies, do those who support them actually live their beliefs? Well, according to this data set, no. As favorability towards redistribution was unrelated to self-reported charitable giving. In contrast, a one-unit increase in dispositional compassion, rather than support for redistribution, was associated with 161% increased odds of having donated to the poor in the United States, 361% in India, and 96% in the UK. Participants in these three countries specifically were asked a hypothetical question, which asked them if they would prefer to tax the rich an additional 10% and redistribute that wealth directly to the poor, or if they would prefer to tax the rich an additional 50% and redistribute only 5% of that wealth directly to the poor. While the former option indicates a desire purely to ensure that the wealth is transferred to the poor, the latter is indicative of spite taxing the rich more while giving even less to those in need. Between 14 and 18% of subjects chose to punish the rich, and while there was no relationship between this preference and support for redistribution, envy accounted for 23% greater odds of preferring the wealthy punishment scenario in the US, 47% in India, and 43% in the UK. Their second series of three studies was conducted solely in the US and designed to further understand the relationship between perceptions of fairness and support for redistribution. Given that fairness is deeply ingrained in the human species, does the disgust for unfairness inherent in our very genes influence political beliefs concerning redistribution of wealth? I will not let myself be cursed by my recessive memes! These scholars separated fairness into two separate types, distributional and procedural. Distributional fairness is defined as low variance in outcomes, for example, that all members of society would have an equal amount of wealth, regardless of individual differences. And procedural fairness is defined as the application of the same laws and standards across individuals and groups. In other words, equality of outcome or equality of opportunity. Participants were asked about their preference for one or the other type of fairness in general, their support for wealth redistribution, and their levels of dispositional envy and greed. Lesson number one. Don't underestimate the other guy's greed! <laughs> in two of the studies, subjects were tasked with distributing a hypothetical windfall of cash between themselves and two other people, either relatively evenly, representing distributional fairness, relatively equally between themselves and one of the other people, with the third receiving a far larger sum, the more compassionate, if unequal, option, or if they would prefer that everyone receive less money, but with themselves taking the largest sum amongst the three the envious option. In one of the three conditions, participants were led to believe that they had been entered into a lottery as part of the research project and had won real money, and then were asked how they would prefer to distribute that real money between themselves and two others. Additionally, in two of the studies in this set, the two other people were described only as individuals of the same sex as the participant, while in the third study, one was described both as of the same sex, but also either as rich or as poor. Expressing support for distributional fairness was unrelated to support for redistribution of wealth across all three studies, while support for procedural fairness was related to support for redistribution. However, when adding in control variables into the model, it failed to reach statistical significance, at least in two of the three assessments. In contrast, dispositional compassion, envy, and expected personal gain as a result of the redistribution of wealth predicted support for said redistribution in each study. That is, a stated preference for economic redistribution was unrelated to actually distributing wealth equally when given an option to, both in a hypothetical and a perceived real lottery. Instead, the best predictor of favoring wealth redistribution was both compassion and envy, as well as willingness for everyone to receive less total money so long as the individual received more than others. And that was the case whether their companions were rich, poor, or given no such financial descriptor. These participants were willing to take home less money themselves, so long as the money that they took home was more than that of the others participating in the project. As such, people who support redistributive political policies, while they may be more compassionate, are also more envious, and when given an option as to how wealth should be redistributed, they would rather everyone have less money, so long as they themselves get the lion's share. And before you turn this video off because it seems that the questions have been answered, hang on because things are 
about to escalate. Unbuckle your f***ers, friends, because we'll be talking about torture in just a few minutes. I don't much like the tone of your voice. The role of envy and self-interest on support for leftist political policies was also studied in a sample of American citizens by Evans and Kelly 2020, who questioned subjects on the feelings of envy they experienced towards the wealthy and those who live lavish lifestyles. Attitudes towards inequality, as well as their various demographic variables, including family income and political party preference, and related these elements to support for economic redistribution. They found that envy of the rich was distributed on a largely normal curve, with similar percentages of people being envious of the rich as there were people who were not envious of them. In contrast, most people were quite strongly opposed to income inequality. These scholars found that the more envious a person was of the rich, the more they believed that income inequality was too large and that the more one perceives the income gap between people to be too wide, the more averse that person tends to be towards income inequality. Demographic variables did little to explain additional variance in aversion towards income inequality except for the political beliefs of one's parents during childhood. Specifically, having parents who were Democrats predicted that one would be more likely to be disturbed by inequality as an adult. However, the politics of one's parents did not account for the effects of envy of the rich on opinions towards redistribution meaning that while aversion towards inequality is related to being envious of the wealthy, it is not a direct result of having Democrat parents. Even childhood wealth was not significant, only having Democrat parents was. That is, you could be as rich as Midas and still want more. I love gold! The potency of envy alone was reduced in the model when self-interest in redistribution was included. That is, not only are envious people more likely to support redistributing wealth, specifically, Envious people who also believe that he or she would personally benefit from said redistribution were uniquely favorable towards such a political policy. These results are indicative that envy of wealth is correlated with covetousness, but also contains a substantial separate component of envy per se. These kinds of findings were so unexpected that Lennon Bates 2021A performed a replication and refinement of Seinser et al.'s experiments, first in a small sample of UK residents, querying them on their support for economic redistribution, dispositional compassion, dispositional envy, endorsement of procedural fairness, personal socioeconomic status, and political party, as well as a preference for harming the wealthy, which being a replication, this study asked subjects if they would prefer to tax the top 1% of Brits an additional 50% of their income, with 100 million pounds going towards the poor, or tax that top 1% an additional 10% of their income, with 200 million pounds going towards the poor. Lennon Bates' results did indeed largely replicate those of Seinser et al. across four models of analysis, again illustrating that support for redistribution of wealth was motivated by compassion but also by self-interest. A preference for fairness was unrelated to support for redistribution. Contrary to the findings of Seinser, however, envy of the rich was related positively to a desire to harm the wealthy, but failed to reach statistical significance in this case. Of the three motivational systems assessed, envy, greed, and compassion, only the latter, compassion, predicted differences in self-reported charitable giving. Further, left-wing political beliefs and support for the Labour Party predicted support for economic redistribution, obviously. Their second replication repeated the first, but broke envy down into two subcategories, benign and malicious, again using a sample of British participants. To explicate, an example of benign envy is, quote, envying others motivates me to accomplish my goals, while an example of malicious envy is, quote, I wish that superior people lose their advantage. This time they found that specifically malicious envy predicted support for wealth redistribution, far greater than did general dispositional envy or benign envy, the latter of which was actually negatively, albeit to a non-significant degree, related to redistribution beliefs. Again, these findings are indicative that people who tend to favor wealth redistribution also tend to lean left politically and are motivated by a desire to harm those who have more than they do, not out of a desire to help those less fortunate via said redistribution. In a final study of UK subjects replicating the previous two, these scholars found that when controlling for compassion and self-interest, dispositional envy, that is again, personality level envy, predicted support for redistribution to a small degree. However, this effect disappeared when controlling for malicious envy, indicating that all three motivational factors, envy, self-interest, and compassion all explained collectively a third of the total variance in individual beliefs about redistributive policies, and that this relationship was largely unaltered after adding in age, gender, socioeconomic status, and party affiliation in as control variables. Thus, these replications can contribute to the evidence that while compassionate people tend to support redistribution, 
so too do people who really just want to take from the haves and give not so much to the have-nots, but simply to give to themselves, and to do so all out of malice. The relationship between envy and greed with support for redistributive politics and social welfare was similarly examined by Hansen 2022 in four samples of U.S. and Danish participants. While the topic of welfare is still rather divisive in the U.S., with its relatively low tax rate compared to many other nations, Denmark has a universal welfare system with a high taxation rate and extensive government spending on social services, because historically speaking, the Danes have a long history of redistributing wealth, largely towards themselves from English monasteries, but I digress. Participants were asked how hardworking or lazy they perceived the rich to be, how much they liked or disliked the rich, and the poor as general groups of people, how greedy both groups were, how strong these feelings towards both groups were for them, their support for taxation for the purpose of funding social welfare systems, their attitudes towards giving to the poor, as well as various demographic details, including personal wealth and level of education. One of the samples was also provided with a vignette that asked them to imagine that they lived in a small village in a foreign country with a man named Thomas. Thomas was described either as rich or as poor, as hardworking or as lazy, as greedy or as generous, and subjects were asked a variety of questions regarding him, including if he should be taxed more or if he should be forced to aid the village, as well as, in opposition, if the villagers should be taxed more to provide for Thomas, and if they should support and be forced to aid him, as well as the emotions that thinking about Thomas evoked and how envious reading about him made them feel. This experiment was designed to see how manipulation of the pro-sociality, that is, how giving of a person they are, be they rich or poor, may influence individual attitudes towards redistribution. Across all samples, perceptions that the rich made an effort to help others was related, but only weakly, to opposition to increased taxation on them, while simply liking the rich was much more strongly related to opposition to increased taxation. In contrast, perceived effort on the part of the poor to help society was more strongly related to support for social welfare programs. In the case of Thomas, belief that he had put effort into helping society when he was poor himself was related positively to the belief that his village should give more money to support people like him and reduce wealth inequality. Similarly, support for taxing the rich, demanding money be taken from them and outright confiscating their wealth by force, was stronger when subjects simply disliked the rich compared to when the rich person had made some effort to aid the poor. In opposition, the effort spent by the rich on helping the poor was related to increased desire for social welfare programs, a demand that the rich do more to assist them, and general support for reducing wealth inequality compared to those who simply just did not like the rich. That is then, that the wealthy actually putting effort into assisting the impoverished in a vacuum does not in any way decrease the demand from others that they always assist more, give more, do more, and instead, it's only those who generally are just not that hateful of the rich that cut them any kind of slack. Seemingly, if the wealthy give an inch, many will demand a mile. How much does he owe you? Because, I mean, like, we, if we just uh, pay you. Who is we? Uh, a dub. A dub? Yeah, like, a, a dub, like, like $20. On $20? I thought it was going to be something like 40 This mother bro. Relatedly, envy of the rich was associated with stronger desire to tax them and general support for social welfare, while those who admired or felt compassion towards the wealthy were less supportive of both proposals. As you would expect, conservatives and independents disfavored social welfare and taxation of the rich. As such, once again, we see the consistent role that envy plays in the desire for economic redistribution, while compassion towards others, all others, including the rich, instead seems to produce the opposite effect. This also seems to be the case despite the fact that compassion itself in Iceland was associated with greater support for social welfare in both the Danish and the US samples, while so too was admiration for the wealthy albeit only in the American sample. A second series of studies from Lynn and Bates 2021b further illustrates these trends. A sample of students from the University of Edinburgh was questioned on their support for redistribution, compassion, envy, self-interest, desire to harm the wealthy, support specifically for coercive redistribution, as well as their perceptions of communal fairness and instrumental harm. Coercive redistribution was measured with questions such as, quote, people questioning the redistribution of wealth should be punished, and, quote, if the wealthy try to avoid tax, it would be permissible to use mild torture to reveal the money they are hiding from the poor. Where's the money, Lebowski? Where's the money, Lebowski? Communal fairness was measured with questions such as, quote, it is just as wrong to fail to help someone as it is to actively harm them yourself. 
While instrumental harm was measured with questions such as, quote, it is morally right to harm an innocent person if harming them is a necessary means to helping several other innocent people. In other words, the ends justifying the means. They found communal fairness predicted support for redistribution, while controlling for compassion, envy, and self-interest. And in turn, envy, compassion, and self-interest all also predicted said support independently. Advocacy for communal fairness was related to decreased odds of wishing harm on the wealthy, but their relationship was not statistically significant. In contrast, malicious envy was significantly associated with a 64% increased preference for destroying the wealth of the rich without concern for any redistribution. Although desires for communal fairness were related to dispositional envy, communal fairness remained an independent predictor for support of redistribution. Instrumental harm, again a belief that violent ends justify the means for the greater good, was associated with support for coercive redistribution. Also, again, a belief that it should be acceptable to punish and even torture those who do not willingly go along with redistributive policies. Malicious envy of the rich also predicted coercive redistribution, as did envy and self-interest. And somewhat unexpectedly, so too did compassion. While we might think that compassionate people would be less in favor of inflicting suffering, when that suffering is being inflicted in the name of retribution for a crime of not agreeing with economic redistribution, compassion as a stable variable does somehow predict support for the torture of others. Yeah, I don't know, make it make sense. These three motivators of envy, self-interest, and compassion accounted for 44% of variance in support for redistribution and 26% of variance in willingness to introduce redistributive policies with violent force with strong effects of envy and instrumental harm also influencing ends justifying the means reasoning. I told you guys that things were going to escalate. Their second study replicated the first in a separate sample of UK participants, but added in the variables of procedural and distributional fairness. Just as a reminder, distributional fairness essentially describes the equality of outcome, while procedural fairness describes the equality of opportunity. They found that communal fairness predicted support for redistribution while controlling for compassion, envy, and self-interest. Further, the inclusion of communal fairness significantly improved the predictive capacity of support for redistribution, explaining an additional 5% of variance, with compassion, envy, and self-interest remaining also independently significant predictors. Once again, both instrumental harm and communal fairness predicted support for coercive redistribution, as did envy and self-interest while compassion was unrelated to coercive redistribution. Perhaps unsurprisingly, preference for economic redistribution was related to support for coercive redistribution as well, with the total model of the three motivational factors of self-interest, envy, and compassion explaining 35% of the variance in willingness to violently force others into similarly supporting redistribution. Procedural fairness, that is, equality of opportunity, was unrelated to redistribution favorably, while distributional fairness, equality of outcome, was related positively. When given an option to redistribute an amount of money between three people, similarly to studies that we've already looked at, this study once again found support for the role of malicious envy, which corresponded to a desire to harm the rich, raising one's own relative status, while simultaneously harming the poor. As such, we see only further robust support for the relationship between envy, specifically malicious envy, and self-interest, as well as a desire to cause suffering to others, specifically wealthy others, and those who themselves support left-leaning political and economic policies. We see consistently then that it's not just greed, but envy and wrath and pride that's present in this group of people, which is pretty impressive, going for a nice four out of the seven deadly sins there. Just don't go looking too far into where lust fits into this socio-political matrix, as it's one hell of a rabbit hole. They're just like passing on dildos, butt gloves, the kids are just playing with them. I just want to talk to them. Wait. Why do you have a shotgun? So far then, we've seen that the tolerant left, if you want to use the boomer meme terminology, seems to be, at least in large part, not so much really driven by tolerance and charity, but by envy, greed, self-interest, and even just pure pettiness when it comes to actually being able to redistribute wealth. But when I at least look at the behaviors of people who identify themselves as left-leaning, particularly when the behaviors concern those who they perceive to be conservative or even just less left-leaning than themselves, I also see, well, anger. Oh, I know somebody should do something to stop Tim Pool. He's wearing a beanie. He's a monster. He probably molests little kids because of his stupid beanie. Whoa well, there, friend. You might need to slow it down. Obviously, this is not to say that right-leaning people cannot also be excessively angry. Not in the least. I mean, Alex Jones exists. Ah! 
Is there some association, though, between political ideology and rage? Well, for answers, we can look to Glyer, 2021, in her doctoral dissertation assessing political beliefs and feelings of deontic anger. No, no, that's deontic anger, not deont ward. But in quick summation, deontic anger is what we would colloquially call moral outrage. While empathetic anger leads to a desire for revenge, moral outrage instead seeks to restore a sense of societal fairness. And thus, Glieger was interested in the relationship between feelings of deontic anger and support for left-wing redistributive politics, specifically in the context of the subject of U.S. immigration. University subjects in this dissertation research project were shown a series of real images of U.S. immigrants that were either low in abuse or high in abuse, accompanied by a brief description of the images. For example, one low abuse image depicted people happily waving flags at a naturalization ceremony being held for migrants, some legal, some not, in California, who had sworn an oath to become citizens of the U.S., while one high in abuse depicted a 16-year-old boy with cystic fibrosis, doubled over in pain, alongside his family after being denied treatment, detained by Homeland Security, and set to be deported back to their home country of Honduras. Participants were asked a large battery of questions regarding anger, fairness, redistribution, and politics. Glieger, maybe it's Glieger, I really don't know, found that the more participants reported thinking that the behavior depicted in the photos was fair, the lower their levels of deontic anger and the less likely they were to describe the scenario as abusive. The more abusive the behavior was perceived of as being, the more deontic anger was expressed. Democrats were consistently, persistently, higher in deontic anger across all instances than Republicans. And the more partisan the position of the Democrats, the more anger they possessed unilaterally. There was a significant relationship between deontic anger and support for liberal immigration policies, such that the more anger expressed, the more likely one was to hold liberal political positions towards immigration. As we might expect, Outside of anger, being younger and having attained a higher degree of education was also associated with support for these policies. Only the photo depicting the low abuse nationalization ceremony did not evoke increased anger and thus increased approval of liberal immigration reform. However, this relationship was only in self-identified Democrats and Republicans, while independents, in contrast, who experienced greater deontic anger became less supportive of such reform. Thus, while Democrats tend to be angrier in response to indicators of injustice, and that anger motivates support for changes to policy, when Republicans are morally angered by injustice, which they're just a little bit less prone toward, they are similarly motivated to support some kind of societal change. There were some additional differences between Democrats and Republicans as it concerned action and anger. Specifically, at low levels of anger, Democrats are more likely than Republicans to report donating to charity. However, in respondents with high levels of deontic anger, it was Republicans who were more likely to report charitable intent. Again, it's seemingly more difficult to make Republicans experience this kind of moral outrage, but when they do experience it, they are as motivated, if not more motivated, to ameliorate some injustice than are Democrats. Similarly, when asked if they would be willing to share a charitable organization's website with friends when strong Democrats were low in anger, they were more likely than strong Republicans to choose yes. But as reported deontic anger grew, strong Republicans surpassed strong Democrats in their likelihood to choose yes. I don't even know if Dutchman would have the ball to say that. Uh, let me just get this straight. You don't have a tip, huh? Thus, Democrats are always a little bit more morally outraged and angry than are Republicans. But perhaps because they're always more outraged, the angrier they are, the less willing they are to actually take any action to mitigate the source of their moral anger. While the opposite is the case for self-described Republicans, who do tend to be less angry, but when they are morally outraged, become far more motivated to actually engage in some behaviors for change. It seems that, perhaps at high levels of anger, Democrats experience a kind of amygdala hijack, becoming focused only on punitive action rather than charity or welfare. With all of the anger and being okay with torture things going on, what about the general acceptance of political violence? There is no denying that any political group can become violent, and the past half a decade of American politics has certainly seen its share of it. Be it the Summer of Love, protesting for a left-leaning cause and leaving at least 25 dead and costing millions in damage in 2020, or January 6, protesting for a right-leaning cause, causing far fewer casualties and property damage but serving as far more of a partisan political flashpoint event. So, do personal politics influence support for instances of violent political protest? 
Well, Workman, Yoder, and Desity, 2020, wanted to examine that very question. But they didn't just stick to basic questionnaires, they also examined neurological activation. So, much like a live leak video, including a truck and a moped, it's time for a crash course on the regions of the brain. <laughs> I made them extra sloppy for you. <laughs> Participants were asked about their self-described political identity, as well as their opinions on a variety of political issues, and then, at a later date, their neural activity was monitored via fMRI, where they were first exposed to a series of images of various protests, accompanied with a short description of the purpose of said protest, to which subjects selected either a thumbs up or a thumbs down to indicate their agreement or disapproval of the event. Next, subjects were shown more protest imagery, but without any signage indicative of what the protesters' cause was and were given a simple description of the cause being in favor of either a conservative or a liberal issue, and with some described using the word protest while other photos were described with the word riot, and subjects were tasked with rating the appropriateness of the behaviors displayed in each image, all while their brain activity was being monitored. They found increased activation in the dorsomedial prefrontal cortex, or PFC, an area associated with morality and sense of the self, the left and right dorsolateral PFC, areas related to decision-making and memory, but also deception and conflict, the bilateral orbitofrontal cortex, a complex area that modulates behavioral responses, the right anterior insula, a region related to empathy, the right posterior cingulate cortex, a connectivity region, and left precaneus, another region associated with memory, but also with goals, specifically, all in response to images that participants believed depicted protests supporting a cause congruent with their own worldview but not in response to protests that they believed espoused beliefs incongruent to that worldview. Additional investigation of other regions revealed that not one participant showed greater activation in the incongruent condition compared to the congruent one. That is, there was no empathetic moral activation with those that they disagreed with politically. There was only in-group preference. Moral judgments of appropriateness were associated with activation in the ventral striatum, a reward center, and the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, a risk and fear center, while moral convictions about specific issues activated the ventral striatum as well. In general, those with the strongest moral convictions were the most accepting of political violence when it came from groups that aligned with their own political beliefs, while also being the least tolerant of violence from those who they disagreed with. To summarize then, these findings are indicative that political beliefs of any ideology, particularly when they produce feelings of moral conviction, light up areas of the brain associated with positive in-group processing, when viewing images of political violence conducted in the name of those beliefs. Specifically, a belief that violence is appropriate was associated with activity in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, while stronger moral convictions were associated with activity in the ventral striatum. This occurs across political ideology, and so, yes, very much, our morals can encourage support of images of violence. And from there, it's not a huge leap to believe that the dark side of morality can encourage violence itself. So, while of course any ideology can promote violence and violent actions provoke the activation in the same moral centers of our brains regardless of ideology, there are perhaps some concerning trends when it comes to the dark side of morality and far-left politics. So, with all of that in mind, Let's come to a few conclusions. Over the course of this video, we've seen that there seems to be a consistent relationship between political preferences and political identity, with some darker elements of social psychology. Specifically, redistributive politics and left-leaning identity with compassion, yes, but also with self-interest, malicious envy, and persistent feelings of moral outrage that can lead to support for everything from coercion to torture. While anyone of any ideology can agree with violence when it supports their political ideas, lighting up their brains like a Christmas tree, people with left-wing politics tend to be more easily morally outraged. Although it should be said that increased outrage for those on the left also produces some charitable intent, it can also reduce charitable intent. Those who lean left seem to see those who disagree as inherently less moral than those who agree, while those who lean right are less prone to this kind of dichotomistic categorization. Furthermore, while people more on the right are very concerned with family, friends, and countrymen, those more on the left tend to have less concern for proximal human entities, unless those people agree with their political beliefs. All of this is not to say or to imply that the left is evil and the right is virtuous, not in the least. 
but rather to illustrate how people, all of whom, share the same moral values, because we do value all of them, but just to differing degrees, can transform aspects of morality of these genetically caked-in stratagems that evolved to protect our species into morality's antithesis. We can see this everywhere from specific classical military and political strategies, from the Chinese art of war and the 36 stratagems, into the art of the deal, just as it is incorporated in Das Kapital, all into rationales for extreme political policies, again, including torture and confiscation of private property. It has been this way since the first ape threw the first stone at another. It was never the question of who wielded the stone, but who controlled the hand that threw the stone. This does not come out of some desire to do evil, but instead, much the opposite. Morality, albeit a dark morality, can motivate and justify such beliefs. It is out of a deep desire to do good and be good, then, that so much bad can be morally explicated to the self and to others. Curiously, then, it is out of this same evolutionary paradigm that bestows us with empathy and compassion that can also curse us with envy, greed, self-interest, rage, and even violence. As the saying goes, it does seem that perhaps the road to hell is paved with good intentions. But hey, what do you guys think? Do you think that left-leaning ideology is really driven by not just compassion, but also envy and greed? Will we ever be able to reconcile the basic schisms we see between people and their moral values? Is everyone of every ideology equally capable of using morality to justify evil in the name of good? Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. And while you're down there, consider leaving a like if you enjoyed the video and subscribing if you're not already subscribed. Also in the description and in the pinned comment, you can find a link to my sponsor, as well as links to my second channel, Broken Crown, where I do two weekly podcasts, one of which covers news and politics, and the other, Rolling in the Isles, is a tabletop role-playing game that I play with Kami Mark and single-player Carl, as well as some other friends. If you really enjoyed the video, you can support my work by signing up for my Patreon or Subscribestar so that you can see your name listed with the lovely lads and ladies here on the screen in a future video. Or you can just purchase something from my merch store. Thank you all so much for watching, and as always, dear friends, Altana Volt.